It'd be great if you could keep open that um, passage from Matthew 5, so keep your Bibles open or switched on or whatever. And why don't I pray one more time before we look at the second half of these Beatitudes together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you um, for all that it has to say to us about how we navigate life um, in this world. Father, we pray that as we read this passage this evening, as we look at it, as we unpack it, we pray that you would speak to us through it. Fill us with your spirit, Father. Um, Help us to understand. And we pray that you'd change us. We pray that you'd make us more like the Lord Jesus who speaks these words to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. History is full of uh, key events, isn't it? Turning points. Where something happens, a discovery is made, which turns everything upside down, which changes everything about how you think about the world, how you think about yourself, and when things will never be the same again. And they're all through history. Maybe when Copernicus realized that actually the earth isn't at the center of the solar system, but the sun is. Maybe when Isaac Newton discovered gravity, or um, uh, Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA. I'm You can tell I'm a scientist. Or when in the late 90s I discovered that S Club 7 lip-synced most of their live performances. Things which totally challenge how we see the world and everything about it. This passage that we're going to look at tonight, the second half of these Beatitudes, or actually the whole thing, this is one of those moments where Jesus arrives on the scene and declares truths about the world that change everything, everything about how we see the world and about how we see ourselves fitting into it, possibly the biggest change that has ever taken place. As we look at this, we're carrying on uh, this new series, um, which we only started this morning, so it's not too late to catch up, uh, where we're looking at this section of Matthew's Gospel, which we often call uh, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7. Matthew's gospel is a, it's an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus, and here in chapters 5 to 7, Matthew records for us probably one of the biggest and most kind of complete chunks of Jesus' teaching that we have. And at this point, Jesus has been, he's been traveling around, he's been preaching to people who would listen, and he's been healing all kinds of dise- diseases and disabilities, and he's beginning to make a name for himself. Huge crowds gather as Jesus travels around. They come to listen to what he has to say, and they come to see what he might do. And so Jesus, um, as we begin chapter 5, Jesus sees a crowd, and he takes the opportunity to sit down and to teach them. So he goes up on a mountainside, we're told, to teach the crowd. And on one one hand, this is practical, because, you know, he's got this huge crowd of people to speak to, so he kind of gets a little bit of height so that he can preach, a kind of outdoor um, arena tour that he's got going on. But there's actually more to it than that. Because if you look back over chapters 3 and 4, as Jesus begins his public ministry, he goes on a very particular journey. He spends time in the wilderness, he passes through water as he's baptized, and then he arrives at a mountain. Matthew sort of maps it out for us. Desert, water, mountain. And it sounds a little bit like something uh, Bear Grylls would do, um, doesn't it? That kind of this, um, this journey that he goes on. But if you were a first century Jew, this journey that Jesus goes on, it would be ringing bells for you. Bells which sound something like Exodus, Exodus, Exodus. That's what it would be saying to you. This is the journey that God's people made as they followed Moses from Egypt into the wilderness, through the Red Sea, and into the Promised Land. And as Jesus begins his his earthly ministry, he walks through the same journey, the same journey that God's people have walked on. What Matthew is doing is he's holding up Jesus as the new Israel, a better Israel, who will succeed at all the points that Israel had gone wrong um, through the years. Where they'd failed first time around, Jesus 
would do it properly. And now in chapter five, as Jesus reaches this mountain, just as Moses reached a mountain hundreds of years before, Jesus reaches this mountain and he declares that things have changed. A new era has dawned, a new kingdom has arrived. Everything is about to change. Over the coming weeks as we carry on through this series, we're going to hear a lot more about what this new kingdom is like, what it looks like. We're going to find out what the way of life of this new kingdom uh, should be. Over these three chapters, Jesus has lots to say about how we should live as citizens of this new kingdom. But what that can sometimes mean is when we open up the Sermon on the Mount, we treat it like an instruction book or a manual. I need some instructions on prayer. I'll turn to chapter six. I need to brush up on the rules about adultery and divorce. I'll go a bit further on in chapter five. We, we kind of think um, Jesus is just laying out lots and lots of guidelines for us. And it's true, there are lots of kind of instructions here and lots of guidelines in it, but first and foremost, first and foremost, this sermon is not just a list of instructions. It certainly doesn't start with a list of instructions. Before anything else, this is a declaration. A declaration that a new kingdom has arrived. Jesus' kingdom has arrived. A new era has dawned and everything has changed. And the whole thing begins with these eight statements, first four we, we looked at this morning, which we call the Beatitudes. I had to look up why we call them the Beatitudes. Obviously, in the Latin, blessed is translated beati, so these all begin with beati in Latin. But I'm sure most of you knew that already. And this morning, Miles really helpfully opened up the first part of this passage for us and led us through the first four of these statements. So... We're going to concentrate on the second half, but if you weren't here this morning, thanks to the, our wonderful media team and the magic of the internet, you can go back and uh, look at this morning's sermon. So I'd really encourage you to do that. In fact, if you're watching online, if you click somewhere here, um, you'll probably find this morning's sermon. Um, <laughs> so do go back and look at the first half, but the Beatitudes are really... They're like when my mum has baked me a birthday cake. A lesson which I quickly discovered was, you need to spend a few minutes looking at the whole thing first and appreciating it before you start slicing it up and kind of dishing it out. Otherwise you find, in all, self, find yourself in all kinds of trouble. So, we're going to look at this whole thing just for a little while before we move on to the second half. Because as Jesus pronounces these blessings, they come as a block, they come as a bundle. And it's actually pretty important that they do. So have a look down at verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you look down at verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus starts and ends these statements with this promise that the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like this. So there are two things to notice here, and the first is that both of these um, end with the reality of the kingdom of heaven. The statements in between, kind of verses four to nine, they get a bit more specific, but he begins and he ends with the kingdom of heaven. And it's not because when Jesus got to number eight, he ran out of ideas, so he just repeated the first one. That's not what's happening here. These two are like bookends. They're like um, a wrapper that goes around the whole thing, which says that this block, this block of blessings, they're all really about the kingdom of heaven. The contents are all about the kingdom of heaven. But the second thing to notice is that they're both, uh, verses three and verse, nine, verse 10, <clears throat> they're in the present tense, aren't they? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All of the others are about something that will happen in the future. Something that will be true at some point in the future. They will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. But when Jesus explains who the kingdom belongs to, he's not saying this will become true in the future. He's saying this is your present reality. This is true right now. 
As Jesus declares that a new kingdom has arrived, he's talking about something that is true here and now, maybe then and now. But also something which has a future element to it as well. The kingdom of heaven is both now and it's not yet. It's now and it's in the future. It's a present reality and it's a future promise. And we live in the tension in between those two things. That the kingdom of heaven is now and the kingdom of heaven is not yet. We're between two worlds. We have one foot in this world in the present. We have the other foot in the kingdom of heaven. And it's not always easy living with that kind of tension, is it? Living in that, um, living at that point. It's easy to forget this promise about the future when we get wrapped up with what is going on here and now. Or it's tempting to try to forget about the ups and downs and the disappointments of life here and now to kind of disconnect from the world and just batten down the hatches until the future arrives. And I guess depending on our temperament, and maybe depending on our kind of theology, we tilt one way or the other, towards now or towards not yet. And yet here, in these Beatitudes, Jesus tells us that both of those are true. The kingdom of heaven is both now and not yet. If you're part of the kingdom now, then you have a future hope, a future where God will put everything right that's wrong with the world, where every trace of sin and evil and rebellion and injustice that we see all around us, where all of that will be removed, and where everyone will acknowledge God finally as king. That is a great future to look forward to, isn't it? That is a great hope for us to have. As we face the difficulties and the ups and downs, the pain of life here and now, to know that there's a future coming where God's kingdom will be fully established and where all of those things, those bad things, will be a fading memory. But it isn't just something for the future because that promise affects things now. It's not just to kind of hold tight and wait for it to happen in the future. As Jesus arrived on the scene, he was declaring that something new had already started. Even though the full reality of it wouldn't be seen until a point in the future. And for those of us who are citizens of the kingdom, now, even though we aren't there yet, this future reality will have an impact on how we live as citizen, citizens of the kingdom now. And as we saw this morning, these Beatitudes, they're not a series of instructions. Jesus isn't telling us to go and do these things so that we can be blessed. For a start, some of these would be pretty difficult, wouldn't, wouldn't they? If Jesus was saying, go and be more persecuted, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to engineer persecution. These Beatitudes are a statement of reality, of what's really going on. People who live like this are blessed because of their present identity and because of their future hope as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. But even though, even though these things aren't instructions, that doesn't mean they don't have anything to say about how we live here and now, does it? Because actually, they're a really helpful measure for just what we think about our future hope. They're like a mirror that we can hold up to examine ourselves, to see if the fact that we're citizens of heaven really does make a difference to the way that we think and the way that we speak and the way that we live. So let's have a look at these, um, finally, let's have a look at these uh, four Beatitudes that we didn't look at this morning, starting from verse seven. And the first one in verse seven is, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And there are a couple of different ways that you can understand mercy, aren't there? It could mean forgiving people who are guilty, not dishing out what people deserve. But it can also mean showing compassion to those who are 
suffering and those who are in need. And actually, I think both of those things are in view here. Um, Jesus is talking about mercy in quite a, a broad way, I think, here. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it, when you remember who's speaking. We've been shown the greatest mercy of all by God in Christ, haven't we? And Jesus has shown us mercy in both of these ways. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus deals with our guilt, with our sin, but he also gets to the heart of the the root cause of suffering and of pain. Jesus brings forgiveness to the guilty and he brings compassion to the hurting. We've been shown mercy and we will be shown mercy. When Jesus comes back to put the world right, because of his death and his resurrection, we have nothing to fear. That will be a joyful day because we've been shown mercy and we will be shown mercy. The thing is that mercy can be costly, can't it? And mercy can make you vulnerable. Forgiving someone can be painful. And other people might look at you and think you're mad for forgiving the hurt that someone's caused you. Helping people who are struggling, helping people in need can cost us in terms of time or in terms of money or in terms of energy and kind of emotion. I guess one of the ways that we're seeing this when we open our newspapers, when we turn on our TV, is with the refugee crisis as it continues to unfold around the world. And we hear repeatedly, don't we, from different directions about the risks of showing mercy to these people who find themselves suffering and alone. The economic impact will be too great if we try to help people who find themselves um, homeless and um, who find themselves refugees. Or maybe there's a risk of terrorism that actually people might take advantage of our generosity. Mercy is costly, but we are people who have been shown mercy. We've been shown the greatest mercy. And so any mercy that we might then show to others, it kind of pales into insignificance, doesn't it? And it's not just about things that we see on TV. This hits closer to home as well, doesn't it? What about um, people who've wronged you? People that you need to forgive, who you desperately need to forgive? What about the suffering and needy people that you see as you, as you walk down the street or as Even as we come to church together this evening, there are suffering and needy people here. Mercy can be costly, but our our kingdom future affects our kingdom present. Jesus has paid the greatest cost. Jesus gave his life to show us mercy. The mercy that we were shown came at the greatest cost And any of the ways that we might show mercy pale in in comparison, don't they? As people who have received mercy and people who will receive mercy, we're blessed when we show the same mercy to others. As Jesus moves on, he talks about, he goes on to say, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Just like the last one, there are two strands that come together, I think, in this idea of having a pure heart. And again, there's a kind of obvious one, and there's a maybe not so obvious one. And I guess the really obvious way that we read that is in terms of moral purity, isn't it? Blessed are those whose hearts long for the good things that God loves, and whose hearts hate the kinds of things that God hates. But I think linked to this phrase this idea of being pure in heart, it can also mean not having a divided heart, a heart which goes in lots of different directions, being single-minded, I guess, if you like. And when you think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it? A person who is pure in heart will be single-minded in living for God and not distracted and turned to the side by all the other temptations and distractions that we might face along the way. And Jesus says that those who are pure in heart, 
they will see God. That is the ultimate future promise, isn't it? That although we see God with eyes of faith here and now, that one day we will live face to face with him. We'll see him face to face. We'll look him in the eye. And so however hard it might be to keep a pure heart, when everyone around you is indulging in all kinds of other things, doing exactly what their, their hearts want them to do, it's worth it to keep going. It's worth it to be single-minded because of where it leads. It leads to a future where we see God face to face, where we see him perfectly and fully. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now Jesus isn't describing a a kind of sense of inner calm and poise when he talks about peace here. That's what we tend to think, isn't it, when in a world of kind of coloring books and mindfulness and all that kind of thing. But what Jesus is talking about is reconciliation, peace between people, whether it's between warring nations or warring individuals or warring families. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, isn't he, in Isaiah? Peace is the hallmark of Jesus' reign and of his kingdom, and Jesus is the one who ultimately brings peace. Through his death and his resurrection, Jesus has brought us the ultimate peace. He's brought us peace with the God who made us. Jesus died to pay for our sin, which drove a wedge between us and God, destroyed our relationship with him, and made us his enemies. And now instead of being considered God's enemies, because of what Jesus has done, because of his death and resurrection, we can be called children of God, which is mind-blowing, isn't it? That we go from being his enemies at war with God to being adopted into his family and called his children. That is the peace that Jesus has made possible. That's the peace that Jesus offers. And in bringing peace between us and God, Jesus makes peace possible between humans and other humans too. When you get home, you can look up in Ephesians. Paul explains really brilliantly how this works. Jesus offers us a way back to God by the same means, by his cross, into the same family. By making peace between me and God, Jesus makes possible peace between me and other people. And people who've experienced this kind of peace, this kind of reconciliation, and people who look forward to this restored relationship where we're part of God's family for all eternity, we ought to be people, the kinds of people who look to bring peace, shouldn't we? In view of the ultimate peace that we'll enjoy forever in God's kingdom. But what would it look like to be a peacemaker? I guess you might be thinking about sort of uh, diplomats kind of in far-flung countries brokering peace treaties or whatever. And maybe your place is on that big, big stage, that big scale, getting involved in politics and getting involved in uh, the situations in the world where, uh, which so desperately need peace. But think about closer to home. Think about the situations you might encounter at work um, tomorrow morning, where people fall out with each other, or where there are rivalries going on and one-upmanship all the time. What would it look like for you to bring peace? For you to begin to bring some of this kingdom peace to the place where you work? What about your family? Many of us come from families and homes which desperately need peace. Where maybe there's anger or bitterness or jealousy going on. What would it look like for you to bring some of this kingdom peace that we've experienced? into that situation. If this was all about bringing peace here and now, if this was all about uh, our present situation, then it would be really tempting to give up, wouldn't it? 
But even now, we belong to a kingdom marked by peace, ruled by a king who gave up his life to make peace possible. And we look forward to a future where we will enjoy real and lasting peace. And so with that in mind, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers because they will enjoy that peace forever as children of God. And then finally in verse 10, things get really serious, don't they? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, sorry. Those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness are blessed because the kingdom of heaven is theirs, Jesus says. And maybe this is the hardest one to accept out of all of them, that you could possibly be blessed at the same time as being persecuted. Because Jesus elaborates on it a bit more in verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Did you notice the little switch there between verses 10 and 11? Jesus goes from talking about them in a sort of non-specific way to you, the people that he's talking to, the disciples sitting in front of him. I don't know about you, but I can kind of imagine them sort of shifting nervously in their, in their seats and, and kind of looking at each other with slightly worried glances as Jesus predicts what's going to happen to them. Persecution is a word that we throw around a lot, isn't it? We call it persecution when someone isn't allowed to wear their choice of jewelry to work. But then there are Christians in the world who have to meet for church in shipping containers or in public toilets for fear of what will happen if, they're, if it's found out that they're Christians. There are pastors and church members who go to jail because they're Christians, because they own the name of Jesus. So it's very easy for us to throw around the word persecution and to sort of devalue it a little bit. But Jesus clearly has a, a kind of broader idea here, doesn't he? He talks about um, getting insulted. He talks about being persecuted. He talks about people uh, kind of slandering us, being lied about. So he clearly sees that there's a range of ways that this will affect those who um, choose to follow him. And some of these things are, are much more the kinds of things that we're likely to face, aren't they? Maybe at school tomorrow, when someone starts spreading rumors about the Christian in the class. Or at work or uni, when people make jokes about the things that you believe. Or maybe when you go home to a family that aren't Christians, when they ridicule the things that you say you believe and, and the things that you spend your time doing. The reality is that when you live in two worlds at the same time, when you live in this world but with a foot in this new kingdom that Jesus has ushered in, you'll stand out. Just, Jesus says, like the prophets of old who... Um, who were persecuted in exactly the same way because they stood out. They took God's message to kings and to people who didn't like what they heard. They stood out and they were persecuted for it. And Jesus is saying that those who choose to follow him, those who choose to bear the name of Jesus, can expect the same kind of thing. But in the midst of that, he says that people who are persecuted are blessed. That they should rejoice and be glad because great is their reward in heaven. And that sort of sounds a bit, a bit weird, doesn't it? It even maybe sounds a little bit perverse to say to people who are persecuted, rejoice and be glad. It sounds like totally the wrong thing to say. We know it's not the wrong thing to say because Jesus is saying it. But it sounds like totally the wrong thing to say. 
unless you have this kingdom perspective that we've been talking about all evening. If the only reality is here and now, if the only reality is what we're living for now, then how could you possibly rejoice in the face of persecution or even in the face of name calling and slander? Whatever would stop you from just throwing in the towel once things started to get difficult? But in the light of our future hope, in the light of the kingdom of heaven, the great reward that there is in heaven, it makes sense, doesn't it? It becomes worth it. If this wasn't true, if there wasn't this future hope, then why would we ever keep going? It'd be much better just to keep your head down, wouldn't it? And to not stand out when things get tough. But we live in two worlds. Right now, that can be difficult. That can be painful. That can lead to these kinds of things that Jesus outlines here. Living in the tension between now and not yet can be difficult and maybe even painful. But we won't live in two worlds forever. It's a temporary situation. One day, the waiting will be over, the tension will be broken, and the future and the present will be the same. So the question is, what do we do in the meantime? How do we live in the meantime? And these beatitudes that we've been looking at today, they begin to give us an idea of what the best kind of life to live right now should look like. And Jesus is going to spend another kind of three chapters explaining the ins and outs, the nitty gritty of what this will look like. But what do we do in the meantime, between now and not yet, we begin living our kingdom values today. We don't wait until we moved in. We begin living them out today. With our eyes on the future, but with, if you like, with our hands and feet still here. We don't do it to get blessings. We do it because the blessings have already been given to us in Christ. Our future is already secure, and so we can live like this as Jesus, um, this blessed life which Jesus outlines for us here.